When it came to looking up information about LGBTQ nonprofits, there's a lot of data about LGBTQ individuals, but not really much out there about the organizations that serve them. I'm Rich Frazier. And I'm Russ Fanos. Welcome to the Nonprofit Fundraising Exchange, a podcast from IPM Advancement. We believe strong nonprofits can change the world. And our goal with each episode is to bring you insightful conversations with thought leaders from the nonprofit sector. Let's dive in. Hi, this is Russ Spanoff, co-host of the Nonprofit Fundraising Exchange podcast and co-founder of IPM Advancement. IPM has just released a report called LGBTQ plus nonprofit organizations in the United States, growth, trends, concerns, and the outlook for philanthropic giving. This report provides a snapshot of the current state of LGBTQ nonprofits in the U.S. And today we're going to discuss some of the key findings in the report and also some recommendations for LGBTQ nonprofits to consider in order to advance their missions and improve their fundraising programs. The report, if you'd like it, is free. Just go to report.ipmadvancement.com, enter your email address, and you'll have it in a few seconds. So today, joining me for this discussion is my co-founder and owner of IPM Advancement, Jack Padovano, and the author of the report, Dr. Colton Strausser. Thank you both for being here. Colton, let's start with you. NPFX listeners will remember you from our most recent episode on nonprofit lobbying. But for new listeners, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure. So I'm what is called a pracademic. Um, I'm a nonprofit practitioner and I'm also an academic. So I keep a foot in uh, both fields and uh, my research focuses on using nonprofit data. So a lot of 990 data, data generated from nonprofits. And so, yes, an accurate tax filing makes the IRS happy, but it also makes me happy because then I can use that to do some research, better understand how our field is growing and operating. And um, that's sort of my background as both a researcher and a consultant for foundations and other nonprofits. Excellent. Jack, what led you to commission this report? We really don't know a lot about how these organizations function as a sector. And my team felt there was a real need here, a big gap in our understanding. And if we did the research, it would be helpful to share it with these organizations and policymakers and, frankly, anyone else who cares about the quality of life for the LGBTQ community. Great. And clearly... Colton was the best researcher to partner with, given his extensive experience in nonprofit consulting and doctoral level researcher background, not to mention he's an all around great guy. (laughs) Excellent. And he's part of the IPM consulting network, which is great. So thank you, Colton. So Colton, when you set out to do this, we we had talked about a couple of different things that we could look into in this uh, kind of niche of nonprofit organizations. How did you zero in on the uh, topic of LGBTQ organizations and how did you go about conducting the research and gathering your data? When we were brainstorming originally for this report, we came up with what seemed like 300 ideas. And, you know, we, we narrowed it down to the top couple. And then I started to try and find out some information about each of the themes that we had. When it came to looking up information about LGBTQ nonprofits, there wasn't much there. Um, it was a long journey to find as many of them as possible. There's a lot of research out there, a lot of data about LGBTQ individuals, but not really much out there about the organizations that serve them. And I thought, gosh, this is an important gap. And it was a hard one to figure out. But I think within this report, folks can see it, it definitely paid off. And um, we we now know more than you know we knew going into this. But um, and talking to some of our um, partners that you know provided some feedback on this research, they're like, wait, you found what? And so they they were excited as well because a lot of times we assume things, but Mm -hmm. until we have the actual data to back it up, you know, for many folks, it was a lot, you know, numbers were larger than they thought they were, which to me provides a little bit more hope than, you know, what we originally thought, you know, we strengthened numbers. We thought we had a small army, but it seems like it was a little larger than we thought it was. Great. Well, what, um, 
you know, speaking about the findings, what were some of the findings that you found most interesting? What jumped out at you? Yeah, I think one of the main ones was actually the number of organizations that was quite interesting. You know, you can't go to Google yet. Um, hopefully IPM will be popping up on there soon. That says list of LGBTQ nonprofits. You can't really type that in. Uh, I went around and asked different organizations like, hey, do you have a list? Some of these were national nonprofits that serve the LGBT community. They're like, well, we kind of have one, but it hasn't been updated in a while, but it kind of doesn't, you know, connect to everything. Mm -hmm. And so that was really our first step in identifying these folks. So we dug through the IRS's database, which is um, a fun journey, uh, going through a jungle <laughs> with a machete, trying to find what you need. And then we also did a ton of keyword searches. Um, one thing you'll notice in this report is that we did exclude um, organizations that only um, had HIV and AIDS as their primary mission. Yeah, you know, while we recognize that you know uh, the LGBT community is connected with this movement to eradicate HIV and AIDS, we thought it was somewhat limited limiting to include organizations that just did that as their only sole purpose. Mm -hmm. And then also the other thing is we uh, removed organizations that while they may serve the LGBT community, they weren't the primary recipient of services or they served, you know, their mission statement would mention, you know, regardless of race, you know, sexual orientation, all these things, which is great. And those important uh, organizations are doing great work. But we really wanted to focus on the the core number where they were 75 to 100 uh, percent serving the LGBT community. And we were able to find over 400 organizations doing that and also seeing the number growing over time as well, which is promising to any movement when you see growth. Um, and we've been able to see that over the last couple of years with the identified number of organizations. Now, when you look at the map, Colton, what jumps out at you in looking at that map? What's the story saying? So, you know, when you look at how many organizations there are, you're like, wow, there's over 400. That's really great. But when you start to plot it on a map, the excitement dwindles a little bit. Mm. You know, with 103 of these organizations being in California, you know, 77 in New York, you know, your remaining few um, are spread out. Many states in the Midwest have less than 10 organizations, and a few states have one or even no organization directly serving that community. So when we think about representation and you know representation matters, and if we think about sort of what the purpose of the nonprofit sector is, you know, the reason we have a nonprofit sector is because the government has failed to provide for specific purposes, whether it's food insecurity, whether it's homelessness, um, you know, the nonprofit sector sector fills that gap. Uh, and also the uh, corporate sector hasn't been able to figure out a way to make money off of it. So they're like, eh, we're not getting involved. So to have states as a whole with large populations, to have no specific organization that we were able to identify, or even a very small few, which, you know, statistically, they're going to be in the urban settings, um, not necessarily serving rural communities. It was really interesting to me to sort of see this huge gap of the, you know, Midwest to the West, you not have much of anything. The Mountain West really stands out. Some folks will say it's because of population and numbers, but, you know, some of the research out there says anywhere between two and 5% of the population of any given state identifies as part of the LGBTQ community and not having an organization advocating for them, providing services, providing community is definitely a large gap within the civil society of the U.S. and of those states. Mm -hmm. And I think we should also point out that we're looking at organizations that file a full uh, IRS form. 990. Mm -hmm. It's not a 990 EZ. There's a lot of smaller organizations that filed the 990 EZ, but this is looking at those larger organizations, which I believe the threshold is maybe $50,000. Yep. So there are a number in the research. We found about 300 other organizations that file a 990 EZ, mm -hmm. which basically there's not a whole lot of financial data there for us to tell much of anything. And that basically means they're small and emerging nonprofits or they're nonprofits that have just decided to stay committed at a local level yeah. and probably are running on a fantastic shoestring budget that they don't need much additional support um, in order to get them to the $50,000 level. So Jack, let me turn it to you and ask you, when you got the first pass on this report, 
as a member of this community, as someone who's worked in the LGBTQ nonprofit spaces, what struck you in this report as as being particularly notable? I think the the, the biggest thing that surprised me was the finding that said that lobbying expenses were increasing, but the number of organizations was going down. Mm -hmm. I was surprised by that. You know, if you think about the threats that continue to exist to the LGBTQ community uh, in in this country, Mm -hmm. all over the place. And as Colton said, we are all over the place. So I'm specifically thinking about workplace and housing discrimination, increasing violence against the uh, against the LGBTQ plus community, you know, particularly the trans community, and and also you know the chipping away at existing LGBT protections by state, mm-hmm. you know, especially in recent light of what what this, this come out of the Supreme Court ar- around abortion and threats to marriage equality, and so. When you think about the fact that more than one in three, I believe, LGBTQ Americans face discrimination of some kind in the past year, including more than three in five transgender Americans, where are the organizations fighting for us? Right, and, and right. So that, that, w- that really surprised me. Colton, on that lobbying issue, did that surprise you when you, when you looked at the data? Yeah, that one really surprised me. You know, there, we have a whole different podcast with uh, Pat Libby where we talk about nonprofits and lobbying and we unpack this a little more. But, you know, one of the things that surprised me was, you know, Trump was elected to office in 2016. I thought, oh, well, the number is going to go up. It's going to skyrocket. You know, it, everyone is going to advocate and lobby. And in many cases, the LGBTQ community and nonprofits are kind of in a reactive stance from what I'm seeing. All these new laws are being passed with very limited intervention, at least lobbying intervention, Mm -hmm. to either change the wording of a law to prevent something from happening, or to even put forward a law of their own that would guarantee protections. And so, Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't expect every one of these 400 plus nonprofits to lobby. Yeah, that's an unrealistic expectation. But Mm -hmm. to only have about, I think it was maybe 20 of them collectively spending a million. Wow. That's not not a whole lot of money for an issue that we see in the news pretty much every day at this point. Yeah. Nonprofits need to get more engaged in advocating um, and going beyond that to lobby. Yeah. And so that's my sort of challenge, I think, to these organizations and those that come after them is, you know, lobbying's kind of a big deal. You can do it. And it's very clear within our current society that we need to do it yeah because if not these discriminatory laws are going to just continue passing and it's going to be a domino effect where all the work that's been done the last you know 50 plus years is going to take another 50 plus to get us back to you know where we are currently which is kind of at a flat line right yeah and it seems like it does get awfully difficult when you're put in a reactive mode for these organizations they're back on their heels and really the only recourse uh, that we might have against these laws is is taking it to court and uh, going the legal route which is very expensive and as we discussed in our uh, lobbying episode a lot of this starts locally. It starts locally, it starts at the state level, and then it moves into the federal level through appeals courts and things like that and might make it all the way to the Supreme Court. But those timelines are very long, and um, it was very surprising to me as well to, to see that um, folks just didn't have that proactive stance. It seems like maybe folks put, took their uh, foot off the accelerator after marriage equality passed in 2015. Took their foot off giving as well yeah you know philanthropic giving and 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 i'm talking about within our own community Mm -hmm. and so i think that is an issue that these nonprofits are facing as well and so you know clearly making the case for support i mean i think it's there Mm -hmm. uh, and and it's strong and it's compelling they they we just need to figure it out out how to do it. Yeah, it seemed like um, during that push for marriage equality, there was a much more pronounced enrollment of allies in that. And and right now, what we're seeing is a, a, a maybe a, a reluctance to broaden out to those allies, to broaden the case for support. 
and to get the entire community enrolled in equality and, and to make sure that we're pushing forward together as a united front. I think that's definitely accurate. One of the things, you know, we did with this report as well is we interviewed a lot of folks that had worked in these types of organizations, um, done advocacy and lobbying. And, you know, one of the things that I found interesting in those interviews is, you know, the, the foot really did come off the pedal, you know, when marriage equality passed. You know, that was kind of the um, holy grail of things people were going after. And they're like, hooray, we won. Mm -hmm. And then the sort of shared policy agenda, you know, marriage equality, you know, they kind of like, okay, great. They folded it up and then they all kind of left rather than sticking around to address all these other issues. And so there's not like full equality within the LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. Not every letter of the alphabet there is um, given the same weight when it comes to yeah. philanthropic giving and support. So yeah, everyone kind of has their own agenda right now rather than the collective agenda, yeah. which is making it challenging to raise funds for a specific cause or purpose, which is complicated for any field. Okay, so let's uh, talk about key takeaways. Colton, what would you like people to take away from this report? Well, I think if we look at the positives, the number of organizations is growing. The amount of funding they're bringing in is growing. You know, one of the nice things that we saw within this report is that government funding to LGBTQ nonprofits is increasing and exponentially. Uh, in 2015, it was 157 million, and in 2019, it was 231 million. So I think with some passage of some, you know, civil rights acts or, um, you know, equality Quality acts um, allowed um, LGBTQ nonprofits to apply for these types of funding opportunities without the fear that the government would step in mm -hmm. and take control of their organization. That's the biggest fear I hear about folks when wanting to take on government funds. They're like, well, we don't want all this strings attached and red tape. Right. And when you have you know, sort of anti-discrimination policies in place, race, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, all these things are included in those statements now. I think many uh, nonprofits are taking on uh, government funding. And also, I think the sort of fear of that funding is dissipating a little bit, mm -hmm. which is great. The best way and fastest way to grow a nonprofit is through government funding, um, you know, philanthropic giving accounts for a lot within the U.S., but government funding accounts for a lot more. Yeah. So taking on government grants is, you know, it, it's a journey, but it's also one um, that pays dividends um, and can really help you serve more people in your community. So that was a really awesome thing that I saw was the increase in uh, government funding. So question to both of you, what can LGBTQ organizations do? Um do right now in light of the findings that we have in this report and in light of what's going on in, in the environment. I'll go to you first, Colton. So one thing is um, I would really encourage organizations to look at their funding resources and sources. There's many philanthropic opportunities that folks can access. Um, and, you know, you don't have to just apply to a foundation that's an LGBTQ funder. Um, a lot of the projects you're doing and a lot of the programs you're doing, uh, many other types of funders would like to uh, fund those opportunities. I will say that um, when we look at funding opportunities, both from foundations and the government, I saw this recently on a government proposal, but the LGBTQ community is becoming more and more included within uh, diversity, equity, inclusion statements. For a while within the funding community, it was really looking at, you know, funding uh, for racial equity. And, you know, that was sort of a limiting place to start, but it was a place to start. Um, and so now I've noticed on some applications that, you know, if you're serving racial equity, there's gender, um, they're now putting in statements about LGBTQ community. And the other thing I'll know is that there's some research out there now to show how the LGBTQ community is also economically disadvantaged. So making less um, per dollar than their um, straight counterparts. And so there are different ways to frame these issues as both economic issues, as well as diversity, equity, inclusion issues. And so just looking at 
how you're putting your fundraising message forward um, and also what types of funding opportunities that could open for you or just another nugget you can put into your you know, case for support on you know, why funding this particular program or service is important in communities. So that's what I would recommend starting with is you know, figuring out where can you find additional funding or um, how can you diversify your funding sources um, given what we know now about where funding flows from? So I, I think I'd like to just piggyback on, on what Colton said and, and maybe just give a very specific way for people to diversify funding. One of the things I think we heard over and over again in the interviews, these leaders thought that plan giving may become less and less common over the years and and certainly in the next 10 to 20 years. So I think nonprofits should consider establishing a plan giving program sooner rather than later. And if they already have one in place, get a, more aggressive with it, yeah. get more assertive as, as we're doing it. And then I think, you know, the other thing, Russ, was the idea of membership fundraising versus straight up philanthropic or individual donor kind of kind of fundraising. I mm -hmm. think membership campaigns, particularly around a particular issue like we've been discussing, workplace discrimination, for example, where advocacy becomes a big, bigger, bigger piece of the success of addressing that. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think instead of just asking for a donation, how about the idea of organizations just asking people to join? Yeah. And they may not have to join with a donation mm -hmm. right up front specifically, but adding your name to a petition, uh, sign this pledge, th those types of things. What we have found in our work with clients is if you can pre-qualify people by them taking an action that doesn't require them to write a check first, once you get that name, start cultivating that that individual about your mission and, and engaging them, you know, an ask for money then becomes a lot easier. Yeah. And and what we have found is, you know, those lists tend to produce fruit because, you know, a high percentage of those people will eventually will eventually give to you. I'm not here to say that everybody should turn their organization into a, a, a membership pitch. I'm not saying that at all. Only only if it makes sense. And a nice way to do it is kind of test your way into it as well. Yeah. So again, I think that those are two ways that people can, can specifically broaden their fundraising activity. Yeah. And it sounds like it's all about the engagement, right? We want to engage people. We want to give them meaningful things to do that go beyond just giving money and give people an outlet, uh, especially now when, when people are frustrated, they're scared. I think a lot of people in the LGBTQ plus community are, are wondering what's going to happen next and wondering how to prepare for it. And these organizations have the opportunity to kind of lead the way for that. So, well, great. This was a wonderful discussion. Thank you both so much for joining me today to talk about these issues. That report, again, that we produced is called LGBTQ plus nonprofit organizations in the United States growth, trends, concerns, and the outlook for philanthropic giving, you can download it for free at report.ipmadvancement.com. And I want to thank our listeners. If you're from an LGBTQ nonprofit organization and you'd like to discuss any of the findings or recommendations we talked about today, please give us a call or contact us through our contact page. We are a certified LGBT business enterprise through the National LGBT Chamber of Commerce Supplier Diversity Initiative. We have a long history and passion of working with nonprofits like GLAD, GLSEN, San Francisco AIDS Foundation, One Iowa, One Colorado, and many more. We offer a free consultation to listeners of this podcast. So if you'd like to do that, go to free.ipmadvancement.com, or you can call us at 877-4-IPM-ADV. That's 877-447-6238. And we'd love to talk to you. So Colton, thank you so much for joining us. Jack, thank you so much for pinch hitting for my co-host, Rich Frazier, who wasn't able to join us today. And we'll return with another full episode of Nonprofit Fundraising Exchange very soon. If you like this interview, please share it with your colleagues and friends. And please check out our back catalog of podcast episodes, especially the ones on lobbying and advocacy. Those could be really helpful for you. Those are at ipmadvancement.com or wherever you get your podcasts. 
We'll see you next time. 